uh, board of directors meeting for July 5th, Pleasant Valley Recreation Park District. And uh, Amy, could you lead us? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And uh, roll call. Director Mishler? Here. Director Magner? Here. Director Kelly? Director Malloy? Here. Chairman Dixon? Here. And uh, amendments to the agenda? Do we have any amendments of the, other than Under there? presentations, just move um, C right after A. Okay. All right. And uh, so we will go with uh, pre uh, presentations, uh, district highlights. Good evening, Chairman Dixon, members of the board. My name is Macy Anderson, and I am the aquatic supervisor, and I'm going to be presenting the district highlights and spotlight this evening. So to start off our district highlights, we're gonna highlight three different parks throughout our community. The first one being Camarillo Grove Park. Uh, this park was deeded to the district in 2002 from the county of Ventura. It's located off of Camarillo Springs Road, tucked in the hillside behind the Camarillo grade. Uh, there are several large reservable picnic areas and playgrounds, as well as off-leash fenced and unfenced dog parks. Uh, to reserve the picnic areas, you can call our district office at 805-482-1996 or visit our office during normal business hours, 8 to 5, Monday through Friday. Uh, we recently went through uh, some upgrades. We did upgrade the parking lot, and then we have our newly renovated nature center and hiking trails. Uh, just as of now, those trails due to the fire are closed until further notice. Uh, the second park I'd like to highlight is our Trailside Park. Uh, this is a small neighborhood park that was developed in 1976 uh, and is in Mission Oaks area. It features several picnic tables, benches, and a small <coughs> And the third park I'd like to highlight is Locker Park. Uh, this is a larger neighborhood park that was developed in 1994 and 1997. Uh, there's a ton of open space, multiple picnic tables, barbecue grills, and a horseshoe pit, and basketball and volleyball courts. So moving on to our district spotlight. Uh, as most of you are aware, July is National Parks and Recreation Month. Uh, and we recognize the logo as Parks Make Life Better and we truly believe that they do make life better. Uh, so in July, we typically see an increased attendance in our programs. Uh, with warmer weather, more people are going to the pool to swim. Uh, no school means parents are occupying kids' times with programs, camps, and classes. And daylight lasts longer, which makes more people stay at our parks later in the evening. So we went through and asked uh, community members, what does your local parks and recreation mean to you? And you'll see some of their responses throughout the presentation. So this is one of them. When I think about um, Pleasant Valley Parks and Recs, I think about the opportunities we have here in the community to come out and interact. Um, a few years ago, uh, my family adopted a new dog, and so we started coming to this dog park and meeting others with similar, there's a lot of dogs here um, in town that, that have been adopted because we have the adoption facility here in town. And so places um, like this park offer us an opportunity to support all those dogs that we um, have and to get a um, better feeling for the others in the community and meeting people across the community. The other thing I really like is the aquatic center. Every year I go get my splash pass and I get in there and I walk the size and I love that. So moving on to our aquatic center, now that summer is in full swing, uh, we do hold recreational swim every day from one to four. Uh, yesterday we had about 150 swimmers in for free for 4th of July free swim. Uh, swim lessons are filling up. We do offer them mornings, evenings, and Saturdays. 
uh, Junior Lifeguard Camp. Our next camp starts July 17th. Uh, it is full, however, we are still encouraging people to waitlist for that camp in case um, we can add more spots. And then our next event is our family float night, which is July 28th from 5.30 to 8.30. Uh, it's going to be dinner and a swim sponsored by Subway. They're very proud. <laughs> so moving on to our senior center. Uh, the senior center hosted an excursion to a Hawaiian luau party in mid-June uh, at Riverside Casino in Laughlin, Nevada. Uh, 50 seniors had a fantastic time, and they can't wait for their next trip. Uh, also last month, they had their senior Independence Day dance on Tuesday, June 27th from 1230 to 230. Uh, over 100 seniors proudly wore their red, white, and blue as they danced to Seniors of Note Big Band uh, and enjoyed refreshments. Coming up this month for the Senior Center, they are holding their Summer Tech Fair on July 20th from 9 to 12. Reservations are required, so call and reserve your spot at 482-4881. Uh, some of the students will show you how to use the basic functions of your electronic device, so if you need help, go see the Senior Center and they can set you up with a reservation. Uh, and then their next excursion is to Oak Glen, a la mode, on Tuesday, September 12th. Uh, seniors are gonna spend the day at the Oak Glen Apple Farm and eat lunch and spend time at the Oak Glen Shopping Center. So for our outdoor education, just a reminder, we have our Junior Ranger Camp and Outdoor Survival Skills Camp uh, with Ranger Lars. And then some of our upcoming hikes, we have our Birds of Summer hike on July 29th and Native Plants, Birds, and Butterflies on August 12th. In our sports department, the Camarillo Girls Softball Association is sending three teams from Camarillo to the state tournament July 7th to 9th. The National Softball Association will be hosting a softball tournament at Mission Oaks Park uh, July 22nd to 23rd. And for Fall Basketball, Adult Basketball League, registration opens July 17th to the 26th. Uh, registration is $290 per team and games start August 7th. <coughs> Hopefully, good 
So Camp Fantastic is in full swing and it's never too late to register. We offer daily and weekly camp rates and even, even sibling discounts. Uh, for those community members out there, uh, call our district office or visit our website to register your kids. Uh, we go all the way uh, through August. Uh, upcoming summer events, we have our movies in, a, in the park every Friday night. This Friday, July 7th, we'll be featuring Moana. And next Friday, July 14th, will be Diary of a Wimpy Kid. Uh, upcoming is our end of summer camp out, August 18th to 19th at the Community Center Park. Uh, register online at pvrpd.org or call our office at 482-1996. Included is dinner, campfire, crafts, games. We're going to have a movie in the park, breakfast, and tons more for you and your family to do. Uh, also upcoming this month is our community band. We have those Thursday evenings starting approximately 7 p.m. Uh, that'll be tomorrow, <laughs> July 6th, the 13th, 20th, and 27th. And then just to wrap up, here's a short video of all the things that we've done uh, throughout the past year.
So like the video says, we try and make all of our residents happy through parks and recreation. And uh, we hope that everyone you know, enjoys the video. And if they would like to see it later, I think we post it online. Yeah. Do you guys have any questions? Any questions, comments? No. no. Thank you. No, that was a phenomenal presentation. Thank you, Macy. It's, you can't watch that and be <laughs> amazed at all the things that this, depart this agency does. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, uh, part-time employee uh, recognition. Mr. <laughs> members of the board, um, I brought up a piece of paper, not because I don't know this person just because I feel I could talk for half an hour to 45 minutes and keep going. So I'm trying to limit myself here. Um, I'm very proud to stand here and let you know that we have nominated and we have come together to bring somebody before you who is an outstanding employee. Anju Oza. Come on up. <laughs> we didn't tell her this was coming, so we told her that the um, manager of our department said that each part-time employee has to come to at least one board meeting. So <laughs> I think she's a little shocked. Um, we can't imagine running all the programs we have at the senior center without Anju. She's a great asset. She has a very cheerful and very patient um, attitude. She works very well with all <coughs> seniors, with staff, and with the volunteers. We have so many volunteers, and she's able to work with all of them. She's always willing to help and assist and train other new rec leaders as they come into the district also. She has a lot of responsibilities at the district. She opens facilities. She closes the facility. And many times when I'm in meetings and, and Denise is off running programs and trying to figure things out, Anju is left in charge at the facility and has to keep things moving and um, answering all the questions that come up. I personally had to cover a lot of the stuff that was happening in the rec department this year. And I also was out for a short while um, due to foot surgery and um, without Anju, uh, things would have had to come to a, a quick stop because um, she really helped us keep things moving along. She came to us about four years ago, not only with a BA degree, but she has her master's and um, she just wanted a part-time job that she could do during the day because her son was in school and she's a very devout mother to her son Arthur and so she wanted to be there after school to pick him up and stuff. <coughs> so. Um, with her accounting skills, she's very reliable. She um, confidently handles a lot of the stuff we have going on at the Senior Center with numbers and counting. And she um, has taken a computer program that we had and has really changed it and made it a technology program. And the seniors all year long can come to her with things from a Mac to a laptop to a uh, iPad to a cell phone. I mean, she sits down with them and patiently works one-on-one -on -one with them, so which is a really great asset, and, and so many seniors are so appreciative of her skills. She works in other areas in the recreation department. She's been out at Dos Caminos working in our preschool because we've been short rec leaders, and she's filled in there. And you see her at many of our big events, at the rummage sales and at the uh, expos, and she recently was out at Trails Day um, in the district booth answering a lot of questions out there. So um, we are extremely proud. Um, we're a little nervous right now because her son Arthur is starting high school this year. And so um, she now doesn't feel she only has to work a couple hours a week. So I'm afraid she's starting to, to look <coughs> elsewhere. But we're hoping we can keep her here with us for a while and continue to you know, utilize her talents and her skills. So on behalf of all the district on you, we are so excited that you're our part-time Employee of the Year. <laughs> yes, we do. Do you want to say something first? Does oh, she want? That on Jew and her husband both recently studied and took the exams and have become U.S. citizens. So she just accomplished that. Awesome.
Thank you. Okay. You want to come? Oh. <laughs> you can put, this, is, this is a fancy gift certificate, so you can put that. Can we turn that light on? Stand, stand over by mic. Okay, um, move on to the Camarillo Community Band. At this time, I'd like to welcome the Camarillo Community Band manager, Dan Rimes. And I brought along Karen. And Karen Gatchel. Sorry, Karen didn't see you. She snuck in. <laughs> Chairman Dixon, members of the board, staff, friends and neighbors, I appreciate being here tonight. I'm going to tell you about the band, and I a quick side thing, you had all the picture taking up there. My daughter was uh, in the family where had an exchange student when she was a senior in high school from Moscow. Also very fluent in Japanese because she was raised partly in Japan for about five years. So I took her out to Soka and all the people realized who she was and they wanted to take a picture of her. Now if you've ever been in one of these shoots, that means every student wants to be in the picture. And so she, they hand someone else the camera and they go back and forth and back and forth <coughs> for 20 minutes. <coughs> so I was amused when you got up there for the picture. <laughs> At any rate, if you put up the picture of uh, Mr. Raymond and myself. I know, I said you the wrong order. Sorry about that. Mr. Raymond, of course, is on the right. Uh, the Camarillo Community Band was founded in 1986 by Kirk Raymond, at that time director of Rio Mesa High School. This summer, the 32nd season of the Camarillo Band is making, making music. Designed by Mr. Raymond, he based this on the summer band concerts that he took part in when he was a kid up in the uh, central California. There are about an estimated 2,000 community bands in the United States, and he just decided that we needed one here, set it up, and ran it for the first 14 years until he retired from it. He organized, coordinated, directed the annual event for 14 years, Decided to step down so he could spend more time with his family. Now, I went back from last year and corrected the totals by going back to a lot of the old uh, programs. He actually directed, of the total of 215 concerts we've given in 32 years, he directed 80 of them through those first 14 years and did a lot of the work and organizing and just total and directed all the concerts. And he finally, his wife said, I think you need to be home with the kids. And that's one reason he retired, because it was just his whole summer was consumed. <coughs> Uh, my first rehearsal with the band, I was, I've been there since day one. My son has just graduated from junior high and I sat in the third clarinet with him, helping him to become aware of his horn and just stayed ever since. I've always been there and helped Kirk. Uh, when we went under new management, when Mr. Raymond decided to step down, I assumed the position of band manager. He and I worked through and we discussed a governing board it's not a legal board in that sense, because primarily we're sponsored by you here. But we set up the governing board of loyal band members to continue and direct the activities of the Camarillo Community Band. <coughs> and then note uh, that three of the board members are charter members, but all, all have participated for more than 20 years. And we'll bring up the charter members in just a minute. But under the new management, uh, myself and my wife are charter members. Mary Ellen Perez Leffler is a charter member. Karen Gatchel is on the board. Doug Hardy, Karen came started in 1995. Doug Hardy started in 1990. And Betty Wyack joined in 1987. So 
these people have been around for a good number of years. Being a charter member really doesn't mean as much when you think of all these other people that have spent 20 plus years being part of the group. Or you got them individually. That's all right. That's uh, my wife on the right, Ray Liner Weaver. You've probably seen him around the campus. He plays in the Seniors of Note. And then the other two uh, were Mary Ellen and, if you can go back to that one. Yeah, Mary Ellen and myself, of course. We found out very quickly, the first year we talked two directors locally into each taking two concerts and sort of co-directing. Well, their wives got a little upset because it was taking so much time during the summer. So we decided to move a slightly different direction and actually invite one director for each concert. They would bring some of their music from their school and we tried to use local directors. And then, and then no one got paid and so then they would go away and another director would come the next week. And this became a win-win-win because we got to see new directors and new music. They got one week to do it and get involved with the band during the summer and then they could take off. The audience wins because you've got different directors, different music. It's just a win-win-win all around for everybody. So we've been doing that ever since. Uh, the community band first performed at Constitution Park for the first uh, 23 years. And Pleasant Valley Recreation and Park District offered the band to move to Community Center Park, which offered better parking, better restrooms. And they said they would construct a stage for its use. Uh, the Community Center Park has, been, has better acoustics than the Pleasant Valley Recreation and Park District. Uh, I'm getting my notes mixed up here anyway. And the employees have been very helpful in getting this set up. And we can continue to perform here at Community Center Park, and we appreciate the support to do that. It's in the summer concerts, the Camera Community Band plays popular songs from swing era, Broadway show tunes, movie and TV themes, like classical, jazz, marches, novelty tunes, patriotic. We even sneak in a couple of contemporary now and then, just to see if you're listening. And then we repeat the favorite from the previous concert each week. We get the people to come up and vote for that. Part of the reason for that is, uh, he says selfishly here, is they come up and we say, put your vote in the donation bin and hopefully maybe you'll throw a dollar or two in with it and then help <laughs> us get our money to buy the marches and pay for our supplies. Some interesting facts. Currently there are 300, this is plus or minus because this varies, 300 band members on the mailing list. In addition, we have a mailing list of just people that want to come and want to know when our concerts are. We normally have about an average of 60 band members play for each concert. We had 50 last night at uh, July 4th, which is probably the most we've ever had. A total of 432 band members have participated in the band since the start of the guest conductors, probably over 500 since the beginning. We've had 25 guest conductors since Mr. Raymond turned over the board, and he was one of those. He's guest conducted several times. No one gets paid for their service to the band program. The only thing we really, it's not a pay, it's a gift to the spouse of the director for letting us have that person's time and that spouse then can take, or a significant other can take them out to dinner. It's an appreciation from us for having that person's time. Uh, donations from the audience are used for the new music, equipment, advertising. It costs us somewhere around twelve to 1500 a year to, to run the program the way we run it. And we're always in the black. We've made sure of that. The band library has over 200 titles purchased with donated funds, and there have been several donations from, uh, in, received in memory of past members. And we have four charter members, which we went through the pictures up there, who still participate this, each, each year to some extent. And that's Mary Ellen Leffler, <coughs> Ray Liney Weaver, and myself, and my wife, Linda. The Camarillo Community Band is primarily an organization for adults, but we do allow students still in high school to participate if they can pass an audition. Adults do not have to audition. They make their own mind up whether they're capable of handling the music. Some only play during the summer, and they kind of get started a little bit, and they've improved over the years. Some have gone out and take lessons. We, I could talk another half hour on that. Uh, we do not expect a band member to commit their time for all the concerts during the summer. They can come just to one concert. All we ask is that they go to the two rehearsals prior, and don't go to the rehearsals for concerts they're not going to attend. That way the conductor, director, can knows what he can anticipate when it comes Thursday night for the concert. We're very loose on that. It's a community organization. If someone doesn't play too well, 
I just tell them to play every little note. <laughs> if you know about music, you know that's difficult. Now, last year I, I read to you why I teach music, which was a very, if you recall, a very moving article. But something else came up oh, about a month back, and I want to read a section of it. This comes from a young lady named Kylie, who currently is going to be a, a senior this next year at Adolfo Camarillo High School. And she had a uh, project where she had to turn in hours and I had to certify that she was actually working in the community band as part of community service. This is what she wrote. Now this is not the whole thing, this is just a part of it. So this is quoting. We only had three practice sessions in which we had to prepare a concert of the same length and quality of the summer concerts. This was talking about the uh, Christmas concert. Which meant we had to focus even more because the community band had not rehearsed together since July. The task required collaboration with other members of my section other members of the band and the band director. If someone around me was confused with a question, I would do my best to help them. Because the cooperation when everyone was imperative, maximizing the practice time was of the essence. At various points during practices, I noticed the director, fellow band members, and myself becoming frustrated when all did not go according to plan or as well as we had wanted. I learned that I have and perhaps developed here the ability to remain calm in unexpected and possibly stressful situations, which will definitely prove helpful in other situations in my life. Furthermore, during the performance, I noticed that the audience seemed very pleased with our performance, shown through their expressions and cheers. The children appear particularly entertained. It was an amazing feeling knowing that the product we put together could create this happiness for others. In the future, I hope to find ways to participate in something I love personally while also benefiting others. Participating in the Camarillo Community Band means a lot to me because music has always been a large part of my life. And although I was not able to play clarinet in high school band, this allows me to continue playing. Additionally, it lets me stay connected with my community, which is important to me because I have been involved in community activities from the time I was very young. As I get older, I feel the responsibility to move to the other side and be the person helping provide those services to people who receive them like I once did. That's just, it's very moving from her and I asked her if I could use that and she gave me permission to quote that. And she's playing in the band, she'll be there tonight. Uh, this summer, I think we can have this out now. There's one, several extras for you guys and one for each board member. What you're receiving there, this is a sample program for this week. The music is in the folder. I don't know that Mr. Hackett is going to play those particular pieces because he doesn't decide until the end of the rehearsal tonight. So this is just a, a made up program in a sense, but it is sort of the format. And then you also have a uh, You have the promo, the press release, and we gave you a flyer of the coming up. I expect you to put that on your wall at home to remind you to come. <laughs> I always tell people in my audiences, if you don't use all the flyers, I have to take them home and put them up for a wallpaper, and my wife doesn't want to do that. But anyway, uh, the concert, July 4th and July 6th, Mr. Robert Haggett from Agura, Agura High School. He was uh, actually born in Camarillo and worked at, uh, as director at... Rio Mesa for 14 years or something or more. And then he moved out of town and then came back and he's now out at Agoura High School. Uh, Daniel Cook, current director at Adolfo Camarillo High School. This is his third year coming up, I believe. Mike Gangemi, Westlake High School. Mike is involved in a variety of things in music and throughout the state, state levels, organizations, and just totally supportive of the music in the area. Uh, very involved with the honor band program. Dr. Julie Judd, who is the Chief Technology Officer for the Ventura County Office of Education, she just starts that job when she goes back on vacation. She's the new person that will start. I know they had a hack the other day and she has to go in and probably take care of that. She, uh, her education is in teaching. She was teaching in schools around the area and, and also is director of the uh, band out at uh, Ventura Unified, the Ventura County Concert Band. So your support of the community band has made it possible to serve the community in several events during the, our 32 years. Annual summer concerts in July on Thursday evenings, Christmas concert in December, 
the Metrolink Christmas train, 4th of July celebration, Memorial Day services at Caneo Mountain Memorial Park, City of Camarillo's 25th and 50th anniversary, we played at both, graduation ceremonies for the California Conservation Corps, we've done for two years this year, they only had two students, and they sent them up to Sacramento, and maybe next year, they have a great program out there to get kids to get their diploma. And some of those things, uh, your insurance doesn't cover that, but the places we go, their insurance covers it. We don't go into detail on that. So we thank you for your support. And your support has made it possible to serve the individual musicians of our community. The Camarillo Community Band, like many other community bands, is an organization which serves the individual. It provides an opportunity for its members of our community to continue making music. Music is a very important element of our culture. Thank you for supporting the Camarillo Community Band and its members as we give back to the community through music. We invite you, the board members of the Pleasant Valley Recreation and Park District, and staff for that matter, to come out and enjoy our concerts. We would like to introduce you to our audience and the members of the band, if you'd like to be introduced and we'll bring you up front. I'll even let you have the mic and talk for a minute. <laughs> uh, we'd like to, as I say, introduce you and we want to thank you in person for supporting the band for the past 32 years. And I don't know what else to say except thank you. Did you want to add anything that I missed? <clears throat> Sounds wonderful. She's moral support today. <laughs> Any questions? No, I just want to say thank you. I've attended your meetings, your performances in the past here. Uh, last year, I was at most of them and everything. I'm looking forward to them again. I really enjoy them. Thank you guys for, for doing all that. I really enjoy it. Thank you. You want to, be, you want to talk? Well, come on up. No, that's okay. <laughs> that's a really bad idea. That's a really bad idea. Uh, the only worse idea is to ask them a geology question. Mm -hmm. Th then you really will never get your microphone back. But now, I'll, I'll my wife. My, I'll make sure my daughter is here when we ask him that question. Yeah, yeah. No, no, don't do it. My wife and I went with Mike uh, quite a bit last year, and I really enjoyed it. And I think having the different leader of the band each 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 time is really great because it really makes it different and seem different. And it struck me as I was listening to it that I've been hearing music out of my phone and out of my dash for so long I've forgotten that there's musical instruments that actually make music and you know you, the the things you guys do in a very short turnaround time is very impressive so there's a lot of uh, work that has gone into a lot of the musicians to yeah to get to this yeah. point it's clearly a labor of love everybody there and thank you you're very welcome I just want to say thank you too because it's very nice to have this is in our community so thank you what you Karen did an interview with the city scene. We uh, last week did an interview with city scene about the Camarillo community band and uh, they did a very nice job editing it and putting it together. So if you want to search for it on uh, YouTube and I can send you the link also. Um, but it was very nice and um, highlighted Pleasant Valley Recreation and Park District very nicely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. Well, thank you very much, and I'll just give you guys a plug real quick that the if, looks like the first concert is tomorrow night at seven o'clock at the uh, uh, Camry Community Center Park. And that's where we're so. off now the yes, okay. we're off to rehearsal right now. <laughs> um, okay. The uh, Camrio Cougars Youth Football Cheer. At this time, I'd like to welcome Bennett Gill and James Driver from the Camrio Cougars Youth Football. <clears throat> well, good evening, Chairman Dixon and board members. First of all, I want to say thank you. My name is James Driver, and I'm the current president of the Camarillo Cougars. And uh, thanks go out to you and uh, several members of our community because of you. We're allowed to continue our program in the community. Uh, growing up as a young man, uh, football was, a, was an essential for me. Uh, it is where I was taught several of the values that I still hold dear to this day. And uh, although many people have mixed values or mixed ideas about what football is, I think the Camarillo Cougars um, has really captured the essence of uh, what football is, especially in a community sense. Um, it really builds camaraderie, a sense of belonging, sense of character for both the men and women we serve, the young boys and young girls. And uh, not only do we have football, but we also have uh, cheer with us tonight. So, uh, so you'll hear from them a little bit later. These are a couple of, oh, they, they brought up the trophy. This is, these are my boys, so I'm not biased. This is Matthew and this is Andrew. They, uh, they were 2016 champions. They were on a team that, uh, of course, I coached. And 
<laughs> and of course we won the championship. And so they're proud, they're proud bearers of our championship trophy from uh, 2016. You can hold that up, boys, if you'd like, and show them. Uh, so without further ado, I think this is going to help me move this presentation along. Had I known, I would have put some music in there. They had some music, and, and I also want to invite the band to come maybe join us and uh, participate with us, come to one of our games and be the backup. You know how to work this thing? It's the right arrow. It's the right arrow? It's the right arrow. See if I know my right from my left. <laughs> so we are... Again, the Camarillo Cougars football and cheer program. Um, I, I'm a big proponent of not just football. I'm also a big proponent of cheer. Uh, I, I have a daughter uh, who is now um, graduated from high school and college, and she was a cheerleader. So anytime I get a chance also to plug cheer, I do so. So cheer is a very, very valuable part of what we do as an organization. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the officers. So I would like, uh, uh, first of all, um, and the brief history and the current state of the program and changes from last year and the financials. So one of the things I just want to highlight here is uh, if you see on the far left, you see Jake Mohart, who went to the University of Wyoming, uh, Wyoming uh, <laughs> University of Wyoming. That used to be a university, um, University of Wyoming, and uh, he has since graduated and now has, uh, is a walk-on uh, with uh, the Saints. Saints. Thanks. Yeah, New Orleans Saints, and he also grew up as a Cougar. So we like to highlight those individuals that have come through our program. Aaron Lamb, 2016, Cameron High Varsity a Football MVP Award. Mark the seventh straight year a Cougar alum has earned this honor. So uh, one of the things that we like to also say, we, we try to keep our young men in the community, so if they can um, go on to the next level where they're especially in high school and play locally, we like to see that happen. Again, at, uh, my name is James Driver and I'm the president. Uh, I'd like to introduce the board members that are here. Bennett Gill is our vice president. Uh, Greg Christine is our treasurer. And my wife is in the back hiding. She's the <laughs> brains of the operation. She's the secretary, but she keeps us all, all in line. Uh, the history of Cabrillo Cruz, <clears throat> we in 2005. Um, and we're now heading into our 13th year. So that's a, that's a major accomplishment. Uh, we've grown from 155 in 2005 to its highest uh, point of 400 in 2007. After seeing a reduction in our population to an all-time low and to uh, 206 participants in 2014, we've increased in participants over the last two years to 250. And that has remained consistent and stable uh, we anticipate a slight drop in 2017 only because our cheerleader had a cheerleading program had a tremendous spike last year and this year they've kind of leveled off so it may just see a little drop but not too not too uh, low in our numbers. One of the things I like about our program and I will stay here just for a second because I played football and uh, went on to college. Um, I, I'd like to highlight this area. A lot of people don't understand this about football. Uh, it's real important. Um, age and weights. We use evidence-based practice to, to generate what we determine how kids should be placed in the right category in terms of their age and their weight. So you don't have a young child playing against someone that is twice his weight um, in the same age group category. So it really, really... Um, brings us to uh, best practices when we're putting kids in the right division and the right age groups playing against equal members of their own weight and size. Um, our current state in 2015, we filled it seven teams, uh, 158 players, and 75 cheerleaders. Uh, <coughs> yeah, we forgot to change that, but that's okay. Uh, that was your error, Bennett, but I will forgive you. <laughs> We remain strong in our base in the community uh, and strong financially. And again, I want to say this is partly due to you as a board and other members in the community because without your support, we couldn't do what we do uh, for the kids, um, you know, getting out there and having fields to play on, um, having access to, to make sure that they're playing in a safe environment safe practice fields. Uh, our facilities that we're using currently are Freedom Park and Mission Oaks Park. 
uh, and we've benefited greatly from those two sites. And, and again, we really, really say thank you uh, to you. Uh, I also want to say thank you, a special thanks, because our point of contact, Lanny, has been a tremendous support for the Camarillo Cougars. He's always been there. Uh, typically, if we call him during the day, sometimes even at night, he answers his phone and he's able to assist us. So uh, with that support, again, either from local companies, private companies, we're able to provide scholarships even for some of our most needy families in the community. We have a lot of kids that often want to play football that just can't afford it. Uh, and we try not to turn kids away. We try to make football uh, not cost prohibitive from kids being able to play football and or cheer. So this last year we provided 11 uh, football players uh, scholarships and four cheerleaders scholarships um, through our own mechanism. And then if we have a kid that still wants to play and uh, we've run out of options, uh, as board members, we will go out and we will pound the payment to try to find scholarships uh, through local uh, businesses and resources um, uh, to assist them in playing football and or cheerleading. So that is, that is a tremendous asset for us. Uh, we've continued to have continued success, as, as I mentioned. Our Bantams uh, last year uh, and our sophomores made it to the conference championships. Uh, and the Bantams, again, only because I coached, uh, were able and I'm humble, uh, <coughs> were uh, American Conference champions last year. Our seniors uh, went on to finish undefeated with an 8-0 and o before being upset in the last minute of the semifinals and the playoffs. And the cheerleaders once again won the 2016 uh, USA Nationals Cheerleading Championships at Disneyland and 2016 State Jams Championships uh, at Pomona. So at this point, I would just like to bring up Amanda who's representing the cheer program to just talk a little bit about, I do not want to gloss over these young ladies because they really, really work very, very hard. And I would like for her to do them justice and talk a little about the cheer. Hi everyone. Um, I'm Amanda. I'm, I'm here with the Cougars representing um, the cheerleader aspect of um, our, our organization. And since the program started, uh, roughly just over 10 years ago, they started with about 30 cheerleaders. And since then, we've consistently, last year we grew significantly, as James had mentioned, and this past year, um, we've been able to sustain that we, we have roughly around 100 cheerleaders again this year, which is a lot. Um, but it builds, um, it builds confidence, it builds teamwork, it builds a lot of the same things that football um, offers to the community and to these children. And when, um, we, learn, we teach basic skills of cheerleaders, so entry level, no experience necessary. We start at ages, we start at ages five last year. And um, my daughter actually started about four years ago, and she's very much a tomboy, but she, she, loves, she loves cheerleading. And for those that want to be a little bit more challenged, we offer the, the competitive aspect of cheer, which is what you see up top. And um, the last few years, we've won a lot of first and second place. And we have a few of our cheerleaders here that are wearing a couple of our variations of our uniforms. But um, they truly enjoy it. And um, you know, I, I enjoy being part of the organization. And I think it's really just really great for the community. So thank you. I mean, girls, so. can you stand up real quick and wave some Changes uh, from last year. Um, we continue to really press ongoing safety and education for the coaches. Uh, last year, with the assistance of the city, we were able to uh, ascertain uh, new helmets uh, with the latest uh, safety technology, Rydell Victor One and the Youth Speed Classic. Uh, we lowered this year, we lowered our cost for our youngest division. Um, one of the reasons for that is because, uh, again, we wanted to have an, uh, our younger kids to have access to football. And, and again, we don't want to make football cost prohibited, so we allowed our younger kids to come in at a lower fee uh, to make the experience a little bit better for them and their parents. And then hopefully um, those kids will then like football and continue on the path uh, going forward. We increased off-season activity to increase skills uh, through a flag football league, seven on seven league and tournaments and cheer camps. Uh, again, we are very, very fortunate as an organization. All things are running smoothly. We are financially sound uh, and we are trying to be uh, and continue to be good stewards 
of, of any monies that come into the organization. One of the things that we have done and continue to do is we partnered with USA Football, it's Heads Up Football. All of our coaches must go through this certif certification training in order to even be onto the field. It deals with uh, safety of a player, it deals with how to tackle, it deals with hydration, it deals with medical issues and how to treat. Um, you know, there was a lot of concern after the movie Concussion came out. A lot of parents, you know, took that deep breath and said, is my kid going to get a concussion? Well, one of the things that we have and we notice is that the better trained coaches are, the better trained our <coughs> volunteers are, the, the, uh, the safer our athletes are. And we also utilize uh, Camarillo High School as one of our resources. Uh, Jack Willard um, runs a camp at the high school. Uh, this year, we are encouraging our, our athletes to participate. We're encouraging our coaches to go. Uh, and it just allows us to continue to enhance our individual skills, uh, our player individual skills, and makes the program that much safer. Um, and again, um, one of our other partners is with the AACCA, the American Association and Cheerleaders, Coaches and Administrators. And again, this helps, again, our youngest athletes and our older girls as well uh, throughout the program. It teaches them how to be safe on the field. You know, uh, and again, we cannot be uh, cautious enough when, when you, we're working with someone else's child. So we want to make sure that we are giving our greatest attention to the smallest detail to ensure safety at all times. And I think, for me, that is it. Next year, I will put some zuzus and whammas on. <laughs> I'm going to put some music on here for you all next year, because I saw you kind of moving a little bit when Happy came on there. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure I include a little bit. I'm going to get you next year. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit more, and I'll put a little couple players on there doing a little chant. I, I see where you're going. So. But again, uh, in all seriousness, I really want to say thank you to your uh, commitment to our community, to the commitment to these young people, uh, because it's truly these are your next firemen, doctors, lawyers, council people, board members, uh, teachers, businessmen. This is the next generation that's going to be running the city. Most of them won't go on to become professional cheerleaders. Most of them won't go on to become professional athletes, but one thing's for sure, they will be in our community. And we want to make sure that they're royal rounded in all areas to become positive citizens uh, for the next generation. Any questions? Yeah. Mike. Yeah, I just want to say thank you again, uh, like I do every year. And uh, I noticed you guys out there practicing and having fun uh, during the season and everything. And uh, I have friends and neighbors who have kids in the program and they think you guys are doing a great job. Just want to let you know about that. But one question, is there any, do you guys ever have a chance to tie in and visit the Rams up there with their practice stuff? Just not the really train, but just to go by and visit and say hi or something? We have not yet gone there, but we have reached out. I know uh, just recently uh, Todd Gurley has reached out to the organization in a, in a broader sense. So we do have some of our kids that are going to his camp in Santa Monica uh, Saturday on the 8th. I know my boys are going. They're signed up to go. So, and, and I know some of our older kids are also signed up to go. So. I was just wondering. Okay, thank yes. you. Thank you very much. Blame. Thank you very much. And, and you can blame not having music on your VP, so. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, You're yeah, right. yeah. I, I don't like to pick on him or anything, but um, I think Cougars is a wonderful organization, and um, I think your your uh, positioning with weight and age is is the way to go. So, uh, thank you again for having a a good successful program, and I love to watch your cheerleaders. So that's uh, always a, a excitement for me is to watch the the young ladies to to cheer. So, thank you again. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I just have a couple of detailed questions here, and I, I looked through the paperwork, and I didn't really see this, but it might it might be there, and I may have missed it. But uh, how many uh, kids do you have in cheer? How many young ladies at the at the present time? You probably have the most accurate numbers right now, don't you? <coughs> Pretty close to a hundred. A hundred. And how many are? in football as of this minute? 144. So basically, there's, the girls, I assume, are mostly in cheer. Are there any boys in cheer? Yes. yes. 
And we have uh, one young girl in football. You do? Yes. All right. Good for her. Uh, so the, the, you have a, a fairly balanced uh, ratio. Yes. I mean, I wouldn't expect it to be the same, but it's, it's uh, actually, it's, it's way up there. I'm, I'm actually surprised. Um, the, one other thing I wanted to ask you, what does it, does it cost to play for each? You, you guys have gone through this every year, I think. Somebody's asked this question. I didn't see it in the paperwork, so uh, I don't know. How many different uh, age groups or weight groups do you have? So our youngest group is our six through eight, six through eight year old. And at the youngest level, the cost is 250. Okay. From nine forward to our 13 year old group, it is 350. Okay, so may I assume that the six to eight was 350 before now it's 250 because you locked, knocked off 100 bucks? Correct. Okay. That's all I had. Thanks. Mark? I, I'm, I was going to ask that same question about the cost, and I'm, and I'm impressed that you have a program that requires so much equipment and so much training to be that reasonable because the equipment that you need has to be really professional quality stuff. Absolutely. And, and to get kids involved at that price makes it competitive with the other youth sports programs. So it's great. And I'm, I'm glad to see you guys growing. Um, I was impressed when I heard the the format of your program when it started, I don't know, 15 years ago. And a lot of enthusiastic people over the years have done it, and you guys have clearly picked up that picked up that ball or run it with it. Thank you very much. Oh, you're more than welcome. I think Ben wanted to add one. I was thing. just going to say that our costs for running are more than what we actually yes. charge. Um, yeah. We do fundraisers. So this year we have a raffle fundraiser. Um, we plan to raise about fifteen to sixteen thousand dollars through that fundraiser, and that offsets the reduced cost that we charge the parents. It allows parents they can't pay the four fifty, they can go and sell raffle tickets and make up that extra hundred dollars by spreading it through the community. Well, the reason that I ask that question is two fifty to participate in any organized sport, youth sport, is, is that's a very very low cost in the overall scheme of things. And frankly, I was wondering how you were able to do it. Yeah, and, and that, that's the way. And then we also, as board members, we also try to go out and find corporate sponsors to assist us. Yeah. It still costs us 450 per, 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 per person. player. Um, we just figured if we get more children involved at a younger age, then they stay with the program longer. Um, and that will help build our numbers in the future. Thank you. Yeah, that's just a couple of questions too. Um, what, when does your season run from preseason practices to the end of the season? So our preseason begins, we officially begin football July the 17th. Uh, that's our first day of conditioning camp. So we have conditioning camp that will cover a two week span. And then our first uh, of practice game begins on August the 19th. And then our first official game begins August the 26th. And when does the season end? Our season ends October. It's uh, October 28th yeah. for uh, Division One, which, which has a nine-week schedule. Division Two has an eight-week schedule, so they end a week earlier, and the playoffs then start right after that. And the playoffs are three weeks long if you continue going. So the season can be 12 weeks long for a Division One team if they go all the way in the championship game, but there will be have a bye somewhere in that first nine weeks. Okay, so you're typically done before before the daylight savings time changes. Is it? Is that uh, no, no. We usually have about a month of practice. Well, when we move, we, we usually because our practices go to 7:30. We start using the lights in September out of the softball fields um, for about the last half hour of practice. But by the time the season's over, the lights are on and practice starts at 5:30. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you That's all again. We truly appreciate your support. Right. So, uh, we're public comment, and I have uh, four cards here. Um, let's see, I guess I'll read this. If, any, if there's anyone out there that has not filled out a, sp a speaker card, uh, please do that now and return it to the clerk of the board. 
and uh, each um, card, uh, each uh, speaker will be allowed three minutes. Um, we have two, two, looks like all four are non-agenda items, as best I can tell, and two of them I'm gonna uh, call, call them up together uh, so you can take three minutes each and for six minutes, uh, Donna Roberts and Art Roberts. Okay. <laughs> uh, my name is Art Roberts. I live at 1091 Del Tio. Um, we've been in the community for 45 years. Uh, again, I want to echo the same thing that other people have been saying thank you for the board and your predecessors because several of the names are up there like Mel Vincent and Elder Locker and Nancy Bush are all people that I've had interactions with in the past. So um, for a city the size of Camarillo to have the breadth of of activities and programs that you all do is fantastic. Uh, from aquatics to Zumba lessons. Hopefully there's one in the middle someplace. It starts with an L that we can start with and that's lawn bowling. Um, life is full of transitions. I was like James Driver, you know, 40 years ago. Now I'm pushing lawn bowling. Um, <laughs> my son pushed me into it and we got started about um, uh, a year ago, but he started eight, year, eight years ago, and he's now a national and U.S. Open champion. And he's represented, and he and his wife have represented the United States in several international events. So he got it started. Now, I think what we ought to do is, is there's only one in the county, and that's in Oxnard. And Santa Barbara has got five. <clears throat> L.A. County's got a dozen. Orange County has probably two dozen. All greens that we should have at least another one in Ventura County and hopefully we could have that in Camarillo. So I provided you with some information from the, well, basically lawn bowling is coming out of the closet. For, for, for a long time it's just been like, okay, it's a senior program. Well, that's because Marcellus Joss, Jocelyn, who is, who is a philanthropist, uh, came in and he started handing out money to him. So any, any lawn bowling event you go to now or a center has got Jocelyn written on it. Um, He's long gone, so we, we need to revitalize it. And I think that the current uh, uh, presidents of both the USA Bulls and the Southwest Bulls are making that effort. So they've reached out to us to see if we can provide uh, a lawn bowling event or a center here in, in, in Camarillo. So I'm, I'm about done with what I wanted to say, but my wife has some more things, and we can ask, ask ask uh, questions and you can, we can respond to those. So I'll take his 40 seconds. Okay. <laughs> um, Art and I are newbies to lawn bowling, like he said, <clears throat> but we are totally hooked. Um, when he gave up a day, a regular day of golf every week to lawn bowl, I knew this guy is hooked on lawn bowling. It's great exercise when you play 12 ins, which is a normal game. It takes two hours and you're walking 4,000 steps. And when I tell people, oh, I'm going lawn bowling, they go, oh, bocce. I went, no, lawn bowling, different, harder. The ball is weighted on one side, so it's going to go this way or it's going to go that way. And, and you got to figure it out. <coughs> <clears throat> when you show up to play, you never know who you're going to bowl with or who you're going to bowl against. So you know everybody in the club, you play with all of them, they you know, play with you, and it's just one big community which is wonderful about lawn bowling. The best thing though I think is you can take an 18 year old and put the 18 year old against an 80 year old and the playing field is level. And it happened this week. We had a young man come on Monday, 18 years old, just out of high school, and he had a lesson. And he said, oh, this is really fun. And so the person giving him the lesson said, well, come back Wednesday. You, you did such a great job. Let you and I have a match. He goes, oh, OK. So the young man comes back today. And I'm looking over there. And you know, I can't really tell what they're doing. So I go up afterwards. And I say, Simon, how'd you do? And he says, oh, he got me by one in the last end. He was like <laughs> all upset. <laughs> Um, so if Camarillo does build a facility, I'm hoping that you will incorporate the youth into it because we need to grow players. And like Art said, our son is a world champion. He goes to Hong Kong and New Zealand and you know all over. And when he looks around, he says, I'm like one of the older ones. And he's 47. 
Um, so we really do need to get the youth in here. The very best thing is that the USA Bowls has contacted the USA Olympics and they have asked for lawn bowling to be in the Olympic Games in 2024 and it looks like it's going to happen. So for us to have young people lawn bowling at this point, you know, we'll have them ready for the Olympics. It'll be great. Um, I know in your packet, Art gave you one of these, and it tells you really, uh, it's really a good thing about, it tells you everything about lawn bowling. But if you read the Walt Disney thing on the back, it really says it all. Um, I will quit now, but I just wanted to uh, share, um, I remember something from a movie once. Um, if you build it, they will come. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. You go ahead. We don't really ask questions at this time, okay. but for somebody that doesn't know anything about lawn bowling or bocce ball, other than I've seen some people throwing balls around on a couple of occasions, uh, could you please explain, just as briefly as possible, what what is lawn bowling? I mean, I have a, some kind of an idea, but. I don't really know much about it. There's a little diagram uh, that's in that little. Pamphlet. I see that. And then, and then what happens is that is that you, the initial thing you do is you throw a little white ball, a jack, down to a lane, like a bowling lane, like a ten-pin bowling lane, except it's on grass or artificial turf, and it's it's a it's a boundary that you have, and you throw this jack down there, and then that becomes the object ball for you and your opponent whether it be singles, doubles, triples, quads, to get as close as they can to that jack. And then that starts the scoring. So if you have two bowls that are closer than the third bowl of your opponent, then you've got two points. And you measure these, the, these off so that you eventually get to where you either have one point, two points, three points. In some cases, you have four points. But that's how it basically is. It's like horseshoes where you just get... You, you cancel out if it's one closer than the other, but the idea is to, is to get as close as you can to that jack, and then you come back and you continue the process, go probably 12 ends. Thank you. Okay. I, I think Director Kelly needs a trip to Oxnard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, matter, matter of fact, July 9th, my son will be back in town, and he'll be bowling at, uh, at the Ecton uh, tournament. And Ron Dawson here is the tournament director, uh, and, and I'm sure that he'd be more than willing to, to give you a couple of lessons like he did to a few of the other board members. You guys don't play for money, do you? No. <laughs> you can, though, if you get good enough. <laughs> Thank Thanks. you. Well, that brings us to our next speaker card, which is Ron Dawson. So. Good evening. Just like Art, uh, I am also been bowling for an over a year. I was an avid tennis player playing tennis three to four times a week. Now I'm an avid lawn bowler bowling three to four times a week. And one thing Donna mentioned was the uh, young man who was 18 years old, just graduated from high school, our newest recruit. And uh, he was telling me, too, he comes from an athletic family playing baseball, basketball, football, as well as 10-pin bowling, alley bowling. And he told me lawn bowling is the most uh, challenging sport he's ever encountered. And, and so one of the things, uh, one of my duties at the Oxnard Lawn Bowling Club is, uh, I, as Art mentioned, put on tournaments, but also my wife and I put on social fun days. I'm also in charge of marketing recruiting. And the tournaments is, gives an opportunity for local, international, uh, tournaments and I think Cameroon would be an excellent location for such tournaments because it does bring in people from other areas of the state as well as other places of the country with the convenient airports, convenient freeway access, uh, restaurants, hotels. I think Cameroon does offer uh, something unique and also you guys have parking which you know, there's a lot of clubs down in LA and Orange County do not have which is a deterrent for daily participation as well as tournaments as well. I think there's a lot of benefits you have here with uh, all the amenities of shopping and so forth for running tournaments and maybe uh, you know more people coming into town and discovering that. Um, 
I say uh, the thing about lawn bowling, it does derive from English, and it's very, very big in all the Commonwealth countries. So any time you go lawn bowling somewhere, you always find this uh, kind of this English gentleman camaraderie. There, it's a very uh, uh, friendly game, and you find friends no matter where you bowl, no matter what clubs you bowl at, and go and bowl. And you're always that's always a nice thing of aspect of it. You're always welcome to other clubs, and like my wife and I, we travel now and go visit other clubs, and it's a very fun entity to do. Uh, I, I, I think the thing about lawn bowling that really is quite unique is the focus it takes, the concentration, uh, the skills, and uh, just the, the camaraderie it builds are all just uh, wonderful, wonderful things. And that's basically all I had to say for you. Thank you. Actually, actually, again, I know we're not, not asking. Uh, Ron, just if, I know we're we're not asking questions, but I'm going to ask one. Uh, the um, when you have the, you're, you're, you're the director of a tournament coming up here? Yes. Is, and how many participants would you expect to have in something like that? Typically we end up with 16 teams. Those are three people per team. So 16 sign three would be our, our entries on that. And how many courts or fields or whatever you call well, we them? We have those? 16 rinks, so that's our limitation. So like there's clubs down in L.A. and Orange County that have uh, several greens, and they have as many as, as maybe uh, 20, 30 rinks. And uh, so, yeah, most tournaments are triples. Okay. So, so a rink is that a per, is that a permanent thing, or is it are there temporary versions of this you set up for a tournament, or or well, you, you yeah, go to the place? Are going to be standing, and mm -hmm. essentially your rinks are there's no physical boundaries per rink. Uh, it's just a, a large field of grass, but there's uh, demarcation lines that you would use in terms of you know bowling towards in that rink. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it really comes down to the, if you had a rink here, how many rinks would you have? And how, that's just a determination of how large you would be able to have, how many uh, people could bowl at the same time. I guess that's kind of where, where I was leading with this is if, if, I mean, if it was something that you were looking to be able to build a facility that could host a tournament, how big of a space of land do you need for something like that? How many mm -hmm. rinks is that? That would be eight. Eight. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah, I mean. That would be equivalent to like a half an acre. Yeah. Okay. And, and eight rinks is a feasible thing as well, too, because uh, you can have your local tournaments as far as, you know, other more. I, I don't think you'd be having international tournaments with eight rinks, but certainly as far as, you know, Southwest, because the people who run it are the Southwest Division. So that encompasses everything from uh, as far north as the central coast all the way down to San Diego. And so when you have a Southwest tournament like we're having next Sunday, people are coming. I have some people come from Northern California, but the uh, majority of them are from the Orange County, Los Angeles area. Okay. okay. Well, thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. Um, and the last speaker card, Matt Lorimer. One last thing. I oh. hope that we get a message across that we would like to get this into the needs assessment study. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, Matt. Uh, Matt Lormer. I've lived in the city of Camarillo for over 20 years. <clears throat> As you're aware, I've been an advocate to build a senior center. It's been going on for several years. Um. As far as the assessment goes, I know that we're um, approaching assessment basically to see what the city thinks we need to build it. I didn't see an assessment done whether we need a convention center. I didn't see an assessment needed when we bought a firehouse to spend a million and a half dollars <laughs> to build a firehouse restaurant. I didn't see assessment when we, when we do projects around the city. We need to build a senior center. It's been going on for several years. And you know something? The needs are going to get greater and greater. You know why? Recently, there was an article in the paper, 70 plus percent income needed to survive in the city of Camarillo. Later this year, the DMV fees are going up. Uh, later this year, uh, sales tax is going up, gas tax is going up. And if you're a senior, you have limited income, you have limited opportunities, 
And where do you go? You go to your local senior center. The senior center, I've been there. You want to see what assessment's like? Go there on a Friday. Several times it's overcrowded. This city needs to spend the money. And by the way, you know what makes me angry more than anything? When I run into a councilman, and Mr. Mike Morgan, who says to me, I'm just going through the motions along with other people for the hell of it. You know something? Get off your ass, excuse my language, and support the people in this community. You know, I don't think it's a joke. I don't, I, it's very serious. This city has a lot of money, and it's time for them to step forward and build a senior center. And you know something? I think it's important for people to come forward and say that. If you're a senior, you should come forward. It, it needs to happen. And you know, if the city of Camarillo doesn't want to get off their ass, excuse my language, and help out, then maybe we need to turn to private enterprise and build that sucker. We need to have a plan beyond the city because I, I just think it's that important. And I'm not here to criticize, but I am going to criticize the city. The city has a lot of money, a lot of money. And they make excuses, and they find money when they want to spend it, but they turn their backs on seniors. And you know, at election time, you should really consider why you should vote for people in office when every city in Ventura County contributes a quarter of a million dollars, and they turn their back on you, the residents of this community. It's shameful. It's wrong. And you know something? I'm not afraid to say it. It is wrong. And for people just to go around and not say anything, it's important. The seniors are important. They're 30% of the population of this community, and they deserve to have something newer. They deserve it. They need it. It needs to happen in the future, and I hope to God it happens sometime. Maybe I won't be around for it, but who knows. But again, keep fighting for what you believe in, because it's important. Thank you, Matt. Um. Okay, uh, are there any other uh, people out there that have not submitted a card that have something? No? Okay, not seeing any further, we'll uh, go on to the consent agenda. Um, do we have any motions on the consent agenda? I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Before we do that, there's a typo. The May 3rd on the consent calendar should read June 7th. I'll amend my motion to uh, to uh, approve the uh, amended consent agenda. Second. Roll call. Director Magner. Aye. Director Malloy. Aye. Director Mishler. Aye. Director Kelly. Aye. Chairman Dixon. Aye. Okay. Item eight. Uh, I'm missing my page here. Okay. Okay. Con uh, consideration of resolution five seven eight for fiscal year two thousand seventeen eighteen uh, final budget and Leo. Thank you, Chairman Dixon, members of the board. Tonight, I'm going to ask that the board consider and adopt fiscal year 2017-2018 general fund and assessment district budget, including the resolution number 578. Over the course of the last few months, we've been holding budget workshops. We held them in April as well as May. During that time, board and staff worked together to get a balanced budget. The preliminary budget was approved on June 7th for both general fund and the assessment fund. The general fund budget will have a $7,542,000 in revenue and $7,526,000 expense with revenue exceeding expenses by almost $17,000. Here is a chart that shows what fiscal years 13, 14, 14, 15, and 15, 16 actual numbers were with revenue and expenses and what we budgeted in 16, 17, as well as this upcoming year, 17, 18. You can also see what we received in Quimby fees.
Here's a quick snapshot of what the fiscal year 1718 budget would look like with revenue, expenses, and capital. Moving on to the assessment budget, the uh, revenue for the assessment budget would be $1,072,000. The expenses would be $1,055,000, with revenue exceeding expenses by almost um, $17,500. This is a very similar graph that you saw in the general fund uh, budget. Again, it's the actuals for fiscal years 13, 14, 14, 15, 15, 16, with the budgeted numbers for 16, 17, and this upcoming year of 17, 18. Here is a snapshot as well of what the assessment budget would look like with revenue and expenses. So this evening I'm asking that the board uh, adopt the fiscal year 1718 general fund and assessment district budgets including resolution number 578. Any questions or comments? So this, uh, okay I guess at this point we go to um, a public hearing on the budget. Uh, so I'll now declare a public, he public hearing open to approve the district's budget for 2017-2018. Uh, for, uh, uh, members of the public are now invited to provide comment only towards the district's budget for year 2017 and 18 fiscal year. If there are any, any members of the public who would like to speak uh, for approving the budget you have three minutes to speak now. And seeing none, are there any members of the public who would like to speak against the budget? And seeing none, we now declare this public hearing closed. Okay. Uh, now we have uh, go on to uh, comments and questions uh, from board members. <clears throat> um, can I start with Mike? No. I have none either. We've discussed it, I think, pretty thoroughly in our budget workshops in last month. So I'm fairly comfortable with it. So, Bob? None. Mark? I, I'd, I'd just comment that um, because we have discussed all of this in incredible detail, but looking at what Leo put up on the screen there, it, you know, it seems like we have very little cushion for this a large amount of money. But the, the way our budgeting process works is we budget as if we had every single employee on the payroll every day of the year, which never happens. So we always, always end up considerably overstating the budget on people. We also budget for, you know, like some emergencies that aren't likely to happen, so we end up low on that. We also budget very conservatively on the revenue side. And um, if you look at your financial report for the current fiscal year, which we're now through 11 months, we're now comfortably over on all our revenue uh, categories and comfortably under on all our expense categories. And in addition to that, there's actually items in the budget where we put money away for emergencies and, and, and for unforeseen expenses. So um, I'm really comfortable that we can live within this budget. And uh, the best thing about this budget is there's 800,000 in capital projects, which is fantastic. And uh, I saw Nick out at the park today and I said, buddy, we got work for you guys next year. And he's excited, as I know the staff all is, about doing all the things to make our parks better and our programs better. So that's all I have. Okay. All right. And uh, uh, Leo, I, I don't want to belabor this because we have spent so much time in the past, but can you just quickly flip back to slide two? It's not the one. Uh, it's, the, it's the one with the uh, the circular columns. Of, of there's the one. Okay. So, revenue, expenses, and capital is now capital is included within expenses. I. No, it's stated separately. It's stated. Okay. It's a different funding source. It's not the general fund that I will be paying for those projects. Okay. So that would be a combination of our Quimby fees as well as our capital that we've been setting aside 
in the previous years okay been building on okay so to, to use those funds if you look at the cash report I'm not sure what page it's on um, you could see that the capital has a separate line item and that would tell you the balance that's in those that's in that um, account and those okay. funds are what we could use okay projects that slides just a little confusing because if you look at our expense and our capital those two numbers together exceed what you what's listed as the in that slide but uh, thank okay thank mm -hmm. you on that so uh, at this point do we have uh, a motion to approve or to adopt for a resolution uh, 578 for fiscal year 2017-18 budget so moved second director Malloy aye director Magner aye director Mishler aye director Kelly aye. chairman Dixon aye All right. Okay, item nine uh, A, uh, increase in the district contribution to the non-represented employee health benefits. And Catherine. Oh, she is much much shorter than me. I am much shorter than that. Um, good evening, Chairman Dixon and members of the board. As you know, I'm Catherine Drury, Human Resources Specialist. Tonight, I am presenting to you an increase in the district's contribution um, towards uh, non-represented employees' health benefits. It is recommended that the board increase the district's contributions to the uh, non-represented employee health benefits. The board asks that staff review the current contributions and evaluate different levels of uh, what different contributions would look like th for this uh, upcoming fiscal year. Uh, during the budget budget process we brought to you um, several different options um, but you guys have asked us to bring back the 70 percent and that's what we're presenting to you today uh, the district currently con contributes 70 percent towards dental and vision and 55 percent towards the highest cost HMO family plan uh, with the passing of the budget this evening we have 17 uh, non-union positions um, eligible for benefit enrollment 11 of those positions are currently <coughs> enrolled at the cost of um, 81,000 per year. With the district's contributions increasing to 70%, that cost will go up another 23,000 for a total of $104,914.64. Again, it is recommended that the board increase the district's contributions to non-represented employee health benefits. Is there any questions or comments? Okay. Right. No, none. No. Mark. <laughs> um, well, since it's my idea, I guess I get to uh, I get I get to talk about it a little bit. Um, you know, four years ago when we got in a really tough position, we had to ask the employees to contribute a, quite a bit toward their health insurance, and um, in the meantime. The health insurance uh, situation has gotten uh, crazier, I guess is the best possible word to describe it, and it doesn't appear to be getting any better anytime soon. Um, in, uh, in our projections uh, for the employee increase in compensation, we gave, we gave them a 1% cost of living increase, which is actually a little less than the actual cost of living. And so I sort of looked at what would be the best way to give the employees more. And it, it, I'm sure I feel like everyone else in this room, my favorite kind of more money is tax-free more money. So um, the way the system works in the United States is employers can give health insurance benefits to their employees and they don't have to pay taxes on that as income. So in addition, in our case, where all our employees are involved in retirement programs, we have to make contributions, dollar for dollar contributions toward uh, their increased pay to their CalPERS and to their Social Security and Medicare benefits. There's added cost to us. So the best clock for the buck for us and for our employees is to pick up a larger share of the health insurance. And um, in settling at 70%, we have picked a number where I believe that we all feel comfortable that no one's going to sign up for insurance they don't need, but everybody will sign up for insurance they do need because the cost is very reasonable. 
And as a part of being involved in CalPERS, our employees have a series of different health insurance options with a wide range of coverages. And um, again, it's one of the benefits of being involved in that large statewide organization. So they do have a lot of options and we go up to the highest HMO plan, although people can pick PPO plans if they want more, depending on what their needs are. But this is essentially a way to help get some of that back uh, and uh, say thank you to our employees for sticking with us over tough times. So that's, that's kind of where I thought it was and I, you know, all the board feels pretty much the same way and, and I'm glad to hear that the, the actual cost of it is, is reasonable and well within, well within our financial means. So that's why we did it and I look forward to seeing those payroll deductions out of our staff go down after this motion is approved. Thank you. Okay, so do we have a motion then to increase the district's contribution for non-represented employees' health benefits to 70%? So moved. Second. Director Malloy? Aye. Director Magner? Aye. Director Mishler? Aye. Director Kelly? Aye. Chairman Dixon? Aye. Okay. Item B, consideration and approval of the position, uh, new position allocation for fiscal year 2017 and 18. Okay, once again, this one is brought to you by me. Um, I am presenting you with the 2017-18 position allocation report. Um, every time we add or delete a full-time or part-time uh, year-round positions from our budget, we present to you a new um, uh, position <coughs> allocation report. And it's recommended that the board consider and approve the updated position allocation report for fiscal year 2017-18. As you can see, since we have officially been tracking the um, positions, the district has been slowly growing. This year, we're asking to add one position to each department. Those positions are the park supervisor, a part-time year-round administrative analyst, and a part-time year-round program specialist. These three positions were accounted for in the 17-18 budget that just passed this evening. Again, this is just to show you where those positions are and what we currently have um, on staff. Uh, we're adding the position of ad part-time year-round administrative analyst uh, for administration. And the recreation department is going to be adding a part-time year-round program specialist. And parks will be adding an additional park supervisor. Since the, um, the budget was passed, this amount uh, that it's going to cost us, the fiscal impact of $65,037.22 was accounted for in the budget. Um, this, is, uh, this is the extra amount that's due, uh, that we're coming out of our part-time budget that is going into this full-time budget. Uh, once more, we are recommending that the board approve the updated position allocation report um, or position allocation for fiscal year 2017-18. Any questions or comments? Okay. Mike, again. Right. Yeah, um, if you can go back a slide when you talk about the parks numbers. Mm -hmm. I, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, you talked about the park supervisor, but wasn't there going to be, a, we're going to be dropping another, it's a transfer. Yeah. We're not actually... The head count's not actually increasing. The, no, the, mm -hmm. but we're just doing it. Well, the way you presented it, it sounds like we're adding a head count, but we're not actually. We're just doing a transfer internal to within the parks, correct? We are not taking away the number of positions that we had um, in the previous year. That number is actually staying the same. We're just <clears> not filling right. that position. So the people who are in those positions, that doesn't really increase. No. I know, but your presentation was for someone who didn't have some more background information to be a little bit confusing. Thank you. Bob? Mark. Okay. Then do we have a uh, motion to approve the... Uh... So made. Okay. I'll second. <laughs> do we have to have a little more formal reading of the approval of the uh, consideration and approval of position for allocation, position allocations for 2017? Director Mishler? Aye. Director Magner? Aye. Director Malloy? Aye. Director Kelly? Aye. Chairman Dixon? Aye. Okay. 
Consideration and approval of the bid award for parking lot resurfacing at Bob Kildee Park to United Paving Company. Is that you, Bob? <laughs> Good evening, Chairman uh, Dixon, members of the board. Um, tonight I'm coming at you to approve our Bob Kildee parking lot renovation. So um, the bid's come in at low is 166, six, uh, 295. Uh, this was identified in 2013-18 long range capital plan. Uh, the funding was identified for it in 2016-17. In September of 2016, uh, we solicited bids and had five companies come out and only received one bid. Um, we didn't think it was fair to the, the district that we only had one bid, so we, we had a special board meeting and asked you guys to uh, uh, reject it. So trying to get this project done is a little time consuming is, is the, with the pool renovation, or the, the pool shut down, we have baseball going on, we have you know picnics in the park, we have boys and girls goes through that parking lot, so um, we, we figured out the best time for it was the about middle of August to end of September, which gave us plenty of time. The job should only take two weeks to do it. So um, again, it'd be 27, 17 of September, we should be done. And then again, this is designed to repair and maintain the asphalt parking lots, keep them all in uh, working order, keep them, maintain them for as long as we can to uh, save money other places. And again, here's some existing parking lot. You see the little moon craters there. Uh, the trees on the right hand side, those are all removed now. And we'll be putting in more trees, a uh, smaller tree. Some, we haven't really designed, figured out a design yet, but we, we need to get water to that area, some uh, drip system. And again, there's just more pictures of it. The one on the right, we just started tearing them down. And it, you can see it's a liability, the way the parking lot ex sits now. We have it all fenced off right now, so nobody can get in there. So we have responsible for over five acres of the parking lots in the district. Um, what we'll do is the same as we did at Camarillo Grove. They'll pulverize 85,000 square feet of it, and that's all, that's all from the, uh, for the Monterey Pines back to <coughs> baseball. All that will be torn up, and uh, they'll remove what they need to to get the exact uh, same drainage that sits there now. Um, we'll, we'll put in 300 foot square feet of asphalt berms, which basically in front of the, the pool and along the baseball side. Uh, we'll reuse the pulverized asphalt, what we can, and compact it to 93% or greater. Uh, they'll, they'll come back and uh, use a hot as asphalt, bleh, asphalt mix, <coughs> three inches compacted. Uh, and then, then we'll come in and slurry 42,000 square feet roughly, um, where the boys club sits, that area. We'll, we'll do that to make it all consistent with the way it looks. We'll do all the walkways um, under the bleachers and we'll get a fog seal. And then they'll restripe to match existing striping patterns. I had a job walk on June 5th, eight companies attended it. Seven companies submitted bids. All seven are qualified to perform the work um, the initial cost for this parking lot was 150000 so we exceeded it by uh, 16295 And we saved money from the Camero Grove project last, last fiscal year of 75000 so that'll help out on this little overture. And this is, again, this is our, our two lowest bids right here. Um, United Paving, they're coming from Corona. Um, I have no issues with their uh, references. Uh, everybody did very well on, it, on, on that. All insurance checks out. <clears throat> and then here's our other bids as we go. You'll see uh, three, four, five, six, seven as I keep turning pages. Um, J and H was our one who did uh, Cam Grove project last year, or this year. Excuse me. And then you can see our top bid was 295. So quite a bit difference there. 
So it's recommended that the board approve this contract for the Bob Kildee parking lot to United Paving, the amount of 166, 295. Any, any questions? No. Elaine. No. Okay. Do we have a motion to approve uh, awarding the bid to United Paving for the uh, resurfacing of Bob Kilde parking lot? So made. I'll second. Director Mishler? Aye. Director Magner? Aye. Director Kelly? Aye. Director Malloy? Aye. Chairman Dixon? Aye. Okay, comparison of the California Association and Parks Recreation Indemnity, uh, Capri, General Liability Insurance and Workers' Compensation versus the Special District Management Authority, General Liability and Workers' Compensation. Uh, Chairman Dixon, members of the board, I'd like to introduce Megan <coughs> Hamlin. She's our new, newest uh, administrative analyst for the district. Um, she has extensive nonprofit experience as well as community outreach and a master's degree and a bachelor's degree from Azusa Pacific University. And again, tonight she'll be discussing our um, insurance coverages. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman Dixon and members of the board. Um, like he said, my name is Megan Hamlin and I am new to the Parks and Rec um, and I am um, an administrative social, um, administrative service worker. I'm still trying to figure out my title. <laughs> um, so tonight I'm going to be sharing with you the comparisons of insurance, general liability and workman's compensation. Um, so it is recommended to you that uh, you continue coverage California Association for Parks and Recreation and Indemnity. Um, so currently the district is um, with coverage under Capri and we have services of risk management with workman's compensation, general liability and pro property management. Um, excuse, we have been a part of Capri for 31 years. We started back April 1st, 1986. So during our comparison, what we did is we took a look at our cost, our actuals with Capri, and we compared them with <laughs> what our proposal was from Special District Risk Management Authority, SDRMA. So this slide here is going to give you the comparison of the general liability. So we're looking at um, our actuals spent with Capri um, this year, which was 87921 versus the quotation that we received from SDRMA at 126152.83. And looking at the differences there, the district would see an increase of 38,231.83. And looking at workman's compensation, the district has spent 129,963 and then the quotation we received from SDRMA was 124,579. So looking at that, we would actually see a savings of 5,384. However, when you actually take a look at this and review it further, we would see an overall increase of 32,847.83. And looking at that and seeing how that is because if we moved completely to SDRMA, we would look at taking that 38 minus the 5,000, and that's how we come up with a 32,000 figure. So then we decided to look at splitting the cost, taking Capri and staying with our general liability, as well as looking at taking SDRMA and going with workman's compensation, since those numbers were what fit with each. However, when you do that, the district sees two things. We're going to lose our 5% multi-program because Capri offers that. As well as with the proposal that we received, we were also getting that 5% multi-program. So when we did that, our overall cost increase would be 7,152.59. So this next slide shows you um, in the numbers themselves, the top row is our current actuals with Capri across the board general liability, workman's comp with this year's actuals of 217,884. The next line down is the quotation that we received from SDRMA. And again, theirs was 126,152.83. 
adding the workman's comp to that of 124,579 brings that to a total of 250,731. And that's where we see that the district would see the overall 32,000 um, increase. So looking at that split cost, Capri's price would then go up for us to 94,000. 228.64 and SDRMA's price then would go up to 130,000. So we would see that 7,000 increase there on the bottom right corner. So looking at continuing this coverage, the fiscal impact, um, we would not see an immediate one. This has already been written into the current um, proposal for 2017, 2018 that you guys have already been looking at. So again, it is recommended to the board to continue coverage with Capri. Is there any questions? Bob, or, uh, sorry, Mike. <laughs> Mike. Uh, Megan, uh, and you may not know the answer to this, but I, I'm, I'm surprised that the general liability would have that much difference between the two different uh, offers or programs. Is there a reason for that? I'm, I'm just curious. I mean, I, I would expect those two prices to be closer like the workers' compensation. Right. But I see a, a, there's a large, fairly significant percentage difference. Right. Is there a reason for that? Do we know that reason? Well, or? I actually did make a phone mm -hmm. call to Capri and talk to them about that. Um, and I shared with them the numbers that I had received from SDRMA. And their response is at the time that I had called SDRMA, um, their quotes came back good. And they said, um, it's very possible that our numbers could actually um, our workmen's, excuse me, they, they said that our numbers could fluctuate from year to year, that's what happens. Um, and it just depends on the claims and things that are coming in at the time, as well as our track, our history, the fact that we've been with them as long as we have, and SDRMA we have not been with. Okay. So they have a, a greater assurance, with, they, they know us or understand us in terms of, from an insurance standpoint, of right. course, they understand what our general history has been, and they're, they're comfortable with that. Thank you. Mark? Yeah. Uh, my only comment would be I'd, I'd like to thank Mary for bothering to do this. I mean, it's easy when you've done the same thing for 31 years to just say, oh, this is what we do and not bother looking. But this is a really significant amount of spending. And um, I know our, our Capri tends to go up and down, again, based on our experience. and we. We generally have a good experience here because we don't have a lot of accidents. We don't have a lot of claims. But I appreciate that you've taken the time in, at Mary's direction to do this because it's, it's a significant amount of money and it's the kind of thing that can sort of get out of line over time. And I'm glad to see that it isn't because they've given us good service. So that's all I have. Uh, doesn't Skirma do more business in workers' comp than they do in general liability? Do you know that? That I do not know. All right. Thank you. Lane. <clears throat> Megan, talk to me about the dividends we get back for people, the staff and board members doing uh, training with SDR May, the dividends we get back from them uh, at the end of the year versus what we would get back from Capri. I don't know the dollar figures on that. Um, what I do know is um, SDRMA does offer, they call it their membership plus service. It's a part of what they um, have with their program. Um, it's a limited amount of trainings that they do offer. Um, SDRMA, um, their free online webinars and services is something that we actually get through Capri. That's something we have access to. Um, and the amount of money that we would be saving by staying with Capri, there's a service that we could get that would meet the same um, needs that is needed for the amount of trainings and such that we get that SDMRA does offer. Um, but I do not know the figures. So what you're telling me is that the SDR may is equivalent, training is equivalent to uh, Capri they for the dividends? They offer a few more hands-on trainings through their actual program that, than what Capri does. But any of their online access, we can get through Capri for free. You can get all of these uh, special districts training through Capri for special districts at, at no cost versus um, and stay with Capri. Is that what you're telling me? They're like the links and the free um, resources. But yeah, the free resources that they offer through that Membership Plus site. Okay, you're telling me that a company who has multi 
agencies that are not all special districts offers the same type of training that SDR May does. That's what I'm asking you. There is a difference in the training. That's for sure. They'll come out and they'll do some trainings for us. SDR May would. Mary, did you look like you have a comment here? Yeah. So make sure I'm understanding um, uh, board member uh, uh, Magner's question is that both organizations do trainings. And if I'm trying to understand, make sure I'm understanding your question, what you're asking is do they do the exact same trainings or do more for the dividends or the money that we get back is yeah. where you're going. So I know last year with Capri, um, we received about 11,000 back in dividends from the trainings and such. With Capri, I don't know, that, or not Capri, with SDRMA, I don't know that we know what those exact numbers would be. Um, I think what we're trying to do is trying to figure out how to bridge the gap. So SDMRA does offer different trainings, and I think one of the things we've looked at is if there's an amount that we could pay to get some of those trainings. I think, Megan, you said there was about a $400 cost that we could get some of those trainings. Yes. Actually, it's equivalent to what SDRMA <coughs> does through um, national seminars training, and it's a professional membership for $400 a year. So there's, so there's some different, but yes, as far as the amount that we would get back, I don't know that we would know that until we actually joined of what that looks like for, for dividends back. And Pre, actually, this past year has said not to budget those because it, it uh, part of the part of the div dividends we get back is also dependent on where all the various groups and and where the insurance rates and all those things end up. So. Okay. Well, so now now if, if I can if I can be clear on that that subject is it my understanding that that. If we take, if we do certain safety training courses and that sort of thing, that we get a reimbursement, a reduction, a year on dividend based on the number, the numbers of those courses that are completed or the number of hours of training that are that are done. Yes. yes. And is the, and that num those numbers are unknown or are they are they calculated into these numbers we've seen today or no, they're or not calculated into those numbers. So so even though the the initial premium. For SCRMA may may look higher if the is the dividend significant enough that it would make make up that difference. Well, and I think that's the that's the unknown part because last year, the last couple of years for um, Capri, we've gotten back. Leo, correct me if I'm wrong, but around anywhere from eleven to about fifteen thousand. So that's I think that's the hard part is you don't you don't know what they're going to give you back. So we know what Capri in the last couple of years. What we don't know is what S SDMRA exactly would be. So that's the challenge with it. I think the biggest thing that we, that we kind of looked at when we took this was that no matter which program we go with, we're going to see a reduction because you have a 5% in there. So when you split costs, I think that's part of the challenge with both of these when you just look at them straight across the board. Is the is the uh, um, the dividend return on the, on the workers' comp or on the liability or on both? Is it? Leo, do you have? We may have to get back with you on that specific on that specific one. But when I spoke with them as far as why there was such a variance in the last three years that I've been here, they said it's dependent upon the claims. This is Capri. Yes. And how, what what is that? What is the numbers for the last three years ballpark? Uh, they, I remember there was eleven thousand and a fifteen thousand. I cannot remember my very first year here. I can get that information mm -hmm. to all five of you. Um, but they said it's various. It varies because of the claims. If we have a high, you know, workers' comp um, claim, then our our rebate goes or our our um, refund goes down. Um, for example, when we had the vandalism with the trees, that affected our um, refund as well. But I can get you the la what we've received over the last three years and get that information to you in the next couple of days if you would like. It just, it just looks like, you know, based on the numbers you, you presented, that the Capri would be the obvious choice. But then when you take into account this whole uh, rebate sort of thing, these, these unknown numbers, if, 
I don't know whether, whether SCRMA could provide us with what kind of rebate. The rebates, I imagine, that not only do have to do with, with our own agency's experience, but probably the, their entire pool of insured's experience. And uh, so, um, but those numbers ought to not, ought to not and a large number, ought to not vary hugely from year to year, you wouldn't think. And I, I don't know if they can, if, if there's the kind of thing that they can provide us what typically they've been able to return and whether, whether or not we ought to um, get those numbers bef before we make a decision on this and know for sure what kind of, what we're dealing with. I would suspect that the dividend comes mostly from a rebate on workers' compensation uh, and ha claims being down because those claims are immediate and they start costing uh, uh, immediately. In regular liability claims, there, there's no payout until the case settles. And of course, there's you know legal fees and so forth that can be generated. And I don't know this for sure because this, not, this part is not my area, but I would suspect mostly the re rebate is going to come from the lack of workers' compensation claims. Uh, also, the amount of money that we got last year was, what, $11,000 or something like that? Thereabouts. Okay. I seriously doubt that it would ever be much more than that. It might be 15 or 14 or something, but it would... And, and all you have to do is look to see if you had any uh, any claims last year, and if you didn't, then you know basically what it is for no claims, uh, and that that's might change, but it's not going to change very much. Um, and so, uh, Dr. Dixon asked uh, the pertinent question: What was coming from liability, and what was coming from workers' comp? And since I don't know that for sure, I'd like to know that because I I, I kind of doubt that we're going to get anything back on liability. It's going to mostly come from workers' comp, but. I don't mind proving to be wrong either. Are, are we up to renew with Capri, or are we a couple months out from renewing with Capri? July is our renewal date. And um, the information for presenting, we have a three-month process to be able to submit if we're going to um, be leaving to go somewhere else. We have to submit within 90 days of our um, last day. And it's a 90-day it's a process. Well, I would like to suggest, since I brought it up over a year ago about us looking at this, um, I would like to propose that, that we go ahead with it this year, but we need to get more information so that we can meet that 90-day if we choose to do that. So I'd like to say we'll, I would be in favor of us going ahead and approving it for this year, but come November, December, I want to see it back on the, the agenda. I want us to be on top of it so that we can see where we're headed with this um, because I, I just feel that, that we're, we need to take a better look at this because it's, it's a lot of money that we're spending and I think we need to have the best insurance that we can and saving $200 is not going to do it for us. We have to have the best insurance and I don't know, I'm, I'm like Dr. Dixon, I don't know where we're at with the, the refunds and things and, and I'm not sure that needs to come into play. but. But it could, you know, so. Okay. Then are, are we going to make a motion to, uh, let's see, I guess it would be to approve Capri. Uh, do, are we making a motion on this? Are we going to approve Capri or, do we, or is this just a, yes. just a direction? Yeah. We're making a motion to approve Capri then as the, uh, to renew our, our policy with Capri. You don't, you don't have to. We can stay with Capri. I think it was more informational, and so if there was direction, then we could bring back more. And we can still bring back more information. Um, so if we are looking just to make sure that I have kind of the points that we'll come back with is that when we're looking at it, it sounds like not only are we looking at general liability and workers' comp, we're trying to figure out what those refunds and if there would be rebates and what, whether they're based on the workers' comp or on the general liability side is kind of what is if I'm hearing correctly of what we're looking at is that when we're trying to when we're trying to assess that yes. okay 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 and item e consideration and approval of an amendment to the general manager's employment contract
Good evening again, Chairman Dixon and members of the board. Um, I am now presenting you with your last action item for this evening. Uh, this is the amended contract for uh, Mary Otten, our general manager. It's recommended that the board review and approve the amended employment agreement between the district and Mary Otten to serve as the district's general manager, along with a 3% merit increase and a 3% biweekly contribution towards deferred compensation. Um, as you know, Mary was hired in August of 2014. Her last performance review was done in early 2016 with a effective date of um, August of 2015. So it's been a, a little over two years since she's had her um, last merit increase, or just, just at two years. Um, this year, um, the board met uh, with Mary to establish goals and discuss her performance. That was back done in April, and the committee, um, the personnel committee also met with, um, with Mary. Uh, the personnel committee has proposed the following uh, 3% uh, merit increase to take effect July 8th, 2017, and a 3% biweekly contribution to her uh, for her deferred compensation plan uh, to take effect July 8th, 2017. That's the beginning of a pay period. That's why that's the date that we're using. The total cost of this um, of this uh, merit increase and contribution would be uh, $8,572 for the fiscal year 17-18, and that was uh, take, taken into effect in the budget that you passed this evening. Again, it is recommended that the board review and approve the amended employment agreement between the district and Mary Otten to serve as the district's general manager, along with a 3% merit increase and a 3% biweek contribution towards her deferred compensation. Is there any questions or comments? Okay. Maybe we'll start with, start with Elaine. Well, I, I just going to say, I, since I'm part of the personnel committee, I met with um, Mary uh, on several occasions. Um, also, um, I think what we need to, to remember is that uh, we've done no um, increase in her salary for uh, close to 23 months. And um, I think that the 3% merit increase and the 3% uh, biweekly contribution to her uh, deferred compensation is uh, deserved at this time. So, Mike? No questions. Mark? Um. She's cheap at three times the price. Uh, Mary is a special, special leader, and we're blessed to have her, and we appreciate everything she does for everybody here. And um, I'm really glad that you're signing up for some more. Thank you. And uh, I'd, I'd say probably the most important thing to point out, too, the, the, for public's consumption is that the that this is uh, not a 3% annual increase, it's, this is over a two-year period of time. So um, it's, it's uh, very reasonable, and Mary's been very reasonable in ter terms of her, her uh, dealings with us. So uh, on that, do we have a motion to approve the amended, amended general manager's employment contract? I'll make a motion to approve the amended uh, employ, employment agreement between the district and Mary Otten to serve as the district's general manager, along with a 3% merit increase and a 3% biweekly contribution toward the deferred compensation. Second. Director Magner? Aye. Director Malloy? Aye. Director Mishler? Aye. Director Kelly? Aye. Chairman Dixon? Aye. Okay. So that concludes our action items. Um, we'll move on to uh, 10 uh, informational items. Uh, and uh, chairman's report. Uh, the only thing I would comment on, uh, like to comment on is that uh, this meeting, probably more than any meeting we've, that I can think of in the last couple of years, has had uh, a number of issues where we have voted to increase our costs on, on various things in the last uh, Five years that, that I've been here, it's been uh, a constant battle of battle of the budget to to bring things into line, and um, there's been a lot of sacrifices made on the part on the part of uh, our employees, and um, I think because of uh, good good management, good job by our employees, and in, in de dealing with the budget, uh, our finance committee has done a really su superb job, 
and our budget has come in line and, and all of these things we voted, voted on today are, are not additive to the budget that we voted on in the very beginning. They are, we're already, already in the budget, so they're not new, any new additional costs and our budget is already very conservative. So um, I feel very, uh, this, is, this is a board of extremely financially conservative people. I don't think there's anyone up here that wants to waste the taxpayers' dollars at all. And uh, so I feel very comfortable with all of the things we voted on today. So, uh, Ventura County uh, Special Districts Association and CSDA. Nothing? No meeting. The next one's coming up would be August 1st. Okay. Our next meeting, if I remember correctly, I think it is. Okay. Where at? It's going to be in Thousand Oaks, uh, Canal Rec and Park uh, headquarters. I know nothing about it, so. And uh, Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy. Yes, I attended the uh, June 26th meeting uh, last week, Monday. Um, the one item I want to talk about briefly, um, they had regular business type stuff, but there was one very interesting item, uh, and it made some of the local newspapers and stuff. Um, one of the proposals, on it, which was approved, was to uh, buy a two, within the city of Malibu, there was a two-acre lot, and it was for sale by the owner. It was undeveloped, and it's, it lies on a creek. And uh, the Senate, so the conservatory uh, bought that for $1 million, and that was approved during the meeting. What was interesting is every single person in that neighborhood showed This about every person in that neighborhood showed up at our meeting. And for over an hour, they were making, they were speaking to us. And usually, almost everybody's in favor of buying these open, you know, keeping things and making them open space. Every single person there that night was against this. They wanted, they didn't want that to be bought and saved as open space. They wanted it to actually be developed, to, to, to form someone to actually build a house on there. And this may sound a little strange, and that's the reason I'm bringing it up. Until you realize this is the same group that has sued us, the organization, and uh, the developer, if you go back in history, when this, this subdivision was being developed, the developer granted public access to the further open space further up the mountainside. Um, these homeowners say that's illegal and that's not, that's not correct. And so they have they have hired their own private security guard and blocked off the street. And if anybody tries to go up that street, they, the security guard calls the city of Malibu Police Department. And they come out and arrest you and all that type of stuff. And we've actually had staff members arrested trying to go up that street. And so there's a big lawsuit going on right now that, that's going to be going to a court case here pretty uh, next year. But they didn't. One of the reasons they didn't want us to buy that lot. If we buy a lot in that homeowners association, then they can't deny anybody from our staff or public access up that road because we can invite guests to go up that road. So it's kind of interesting why they're doing all this. But anyway, um, they just basically they they came in for an hour. They were talking how great it was for them to use the hiking trail and the creek, and they thought it was real nice and everything. They just don't want anybody else up there. <laughs> it's about, it's, it was very interesting because they, they, they th oh, this is a great area, beautiful. They like to go hiking all the time. They just don't want anybody else coming in to hike up there. So it was kind of interesting. That was our argument, basically. That's all. All right, uh, standing committees, uh, personnel, anything more? We didn't, we didn't have any meeting. And uh, finance? Finance, as I mentioned before, we're comfortably under on spending and expenses. We're over $3.5 million ahead of our bank balance a year ago, and uh, we're soon to complete the year budget. And uh, now that Leo's got the budget behind her, she can work on the audit of this year's financials. So we're in great shape. And uh, liaison? I mean, okay. uh, the liaison committee did did meet and um, met with a group from the uh, Miracle League, and um, they have an interesting proposal that uh, I think needs a lot more investigation before we can really have an idea where we can go with it. But they, basically, they're they're looking at uh, developing and a specialized baseball field for um, special needs. Uh, Children and adults to, uh, to to be used as uh, uh, 
wheelchair accessible and, and uh, other disabilities accessible field to play baseball on and also to with the idea of, of making that field available for, uh, for use to the general pu general public also um, so uh, there's still a lot a long ways to go in terms of investigating whether that's really a viable option or not but it was a very interesting meeting so and there'll be more to come on that uh, foundation we've been meeting and thanks to Megan we're moving quite quickly along to our uh, event on August 26th and uh, looking for some more sponsors and looking for some more people to attend and um, if uh, you're interested why we'd love to have you join us uh, uh, on August 26th out at um, Cam Maria Grove uh, I think we're minus one tree since the last time we met out there but uh, I think we'll be fine. We have plenty of trees and plenty of space for us to have a, a beautiful night of, uh, and Megan, tell me again, what is it called? Starry? Starlit Summer, summer Nights. So um, it's, we're, we're just going to have a, a great evening out there with live music and, and silent auction and things. So please come and join us. And General Manager's report. Okay, just a couple updates. A uh, couple updates regarding Camarillo Grove Park. As, uh, as Director Magner just mentioned, we did lose one of the big oak trees. Um, if you've been out there, which is sad because it was a beautiful tree, um, but we're in the process of, of cutting that all up. Uh, the Nature Center is closed. Hopefully that'll be open next week once we get that removed. Um, yesterday there was a fire out by Cam Grove Park. So today there was limited access into the park. Um, fire uh, was working on the hot spots and such. We did have, there was, as they were um, fighting the fire yesterday, there was a spark that actually jumped over into the park. Fortunately, they were there. Um, otherwise, that could have been really bad news for us. Um, so it did do some damage to the trail. So Cal Fire right now is working, or Ventura County Fire is working to kind of put back some of the vegetation and such. But the trail, as uh, Macy had said earlier, is closed right now until further notice because it's at the trail site where the, the lower and upper trail meet. So we're hoping to get that repaired and start working on that. So um, the trail was open for little over a month or so and now it's closed unfortunately but we need to make sure that it's secure and safe so um, that's the update kind of with the park some other updates um, Can I ask you about that tree before you go on sure what caused that what what was the issue with that oak tree I think part of it was stress. was it disease or something else no I think stress and old correct Bob So there might have been some root access, I mean, root issues. Okay, thank you. I'm just wondering. Thank how, you. how old do you think that tree was? Oh. I, I just was curious. Mm. Yeah, it was a beautiful tree. So um, I know that typically we're dark in August, but we will have a special sec session on August 10th, and that will be the start of the wonderful capital projects and timelines that will be coming through. So we'll keep everybody updated, but there'll be, I think this fall we'll have probably six or seven that'll be coming on that meeting alone just to get all of those things started with roofs and all of that kind of stuff. So we hit that before the, hopefully another rainy season. Um, the city passed the cooperative agreement. So the RFP for the community recreation facility needs study proposal went on on June 23rd and that closes on July 24th. And then we'll be working once again with the liaison committees to hopefully pick a, um, a finalist and then in September approving that. A couple of quick legislative updates. Um, I think that I had sent out some information and regarding Senate Bill 119, which is employee orientation. So Director Magner had mentioned that last time, which the new law now requires that 
that when we do an employee orientation, when it, re, when it relates to a union employee, we now are required to have a representative there. They have the opportunity to be present. So it's one of those bills that they've passed. So we'll have to um, figure out how we kind of deal with that. And when we do employee orientations, we have to give them 10 days notice. So we'll be working through some of the logistics with that. Is that for new employees or that any new. type of? Any this? new any any new employee that's in the union. So that passed saying that anybody that we do a new orientation that's in the union would then, we'd have to give, the, give them 10 days notice so they could be present at it. So that'll add a few extra quirks in that. And then a new one that is just coming out is Senate Bill 496, which is the de design professional indemnity. So that's another one that we've been going back and forth and with um, uh, CSDA of we've been trying to get that off the docket. And basically what that means is that an architect, landscape architect, engineer, or land survey is only responsible for cost to defend a client that exceeds the design professional. So in essence, what they're saying is that if I could design something and then it doesn't work or it's not built to specs, the only thing we can hold the design responsible for is whatever por portion. So if they had, there was 25% of it that wasn't correct, then that's all the portion that they would have to pay and the district would have to pick up the rest. So it's one of those that will that's that uh, I know SD or CSDA really pushed back on because what that means is that we're the district now is held liable for attorney fees and all of that even though we're not the design person on that project. So that was who pushed it? Um, I'm not sure. Do you know Director Magner who actually pushed that bill? I know we pushed back. It could have been De Leon that pushed it, but I know that CSDA pushed back fairly hard on that for the last year or so, and we thought that it was defeated, and then it kind of it, it came back with some modifications. So, those are a couple things right now that just through the state and through legislation that that do that will have an effect on us down the road. So, um, just a couple other things. Just a reminder: uh, committee meetings, July. We have finance on the 19th, policy on the 27th, and then we have this special board meeting on August 10th. And just last reminder is we have community band starting tomorrow. The movies in the park are on Fridays at the community center. Family float night at the end of July on the 28th. We have the military expo in August and the party for the barks in August. So things to look forward to that are coming up. Thank you. Oral communications. Mike? None, thank you. Elaine? Yeah, I, I think um, tonight, um, I, Mark always talks to the, the crowd and so does Bob. And so I think what you didn't see tonight was a lot of conversation on the budget and things, but um, I think what it shows us is what the great job our staff is doing, um, putting together the workshops and presenting us uh, very, very it entailed information so it's easy to go through and um, they answer our questions and when we get ready to, to do these kind of meetings we don't have to sit here for, you know, 35, 45 minutes to talk about each one of them. So uh, I want to thank the staff. You do a wonderful job. Um, we always look forward to, to getting through this process and, and things. So once again, Thank you, and uh, thanks to Catherine and Megan for putting on their presentations tonight. It's uh, always difficult when you get up in front of, of the person who is going to pick it apart. So uh, I thank both of you for being patient. So thanks again. Yeah, I, I uh, agree with my fellow board member that uh, the staff here, especially in the last, I've noticed it, and it was probably existed before, but I really appreciate it in the last four or five years, um, that we're so well prepared when we come up here, a lot of times there isn't a lot of discussion um, because we've been at meetings. We have lots of meetings that the general public may not uh, know about. They may, may in some cases believe we just come here once a month and, and that's it, but that's, that's really not the case. 
we have special board meetings where all of us are there and we have committee uh, meetings and all kinds of things and so uh, sometimes on the most important items like the budget we're we've met many many times before we ever even got here and so all the questions have pretty much been uh, hashed out beforehand uh, so we wouldn't want the general public to think that we're just on something like the budget with just the minimal amount of discussion and that's been made clear by all the uh, um, the, the directors here but uh, uh, I'm just throwing in my two cents um, uh, there was one other thing uh, that I was going to say and now I've forgotten it so uh, can I reserve just in case I remember it <laughs> when everyone else is done okay Mark. Is that a senior moment asterisk? Is that what you're <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Um, I, I just wanted to mention one thing. Um, I was watching the city council meeting on TV, and um, they were considering doing the needs assessment with us. And a couple of the council persons were having questions that this, their staff was sort of struggling to answer. And um, I sent Mary a text and said, are you in the audience? And her, her phone had died, so she didn't get my text. But fortunately, she was watching television. She hopped in her car. She came down here. She answered the questions of the council and to their satisfaction. And we were able to move the thing forward. And I just wanted to thank you for going the extra mile. And you know, you, you never stop for us. Thank you. That's all I have. OK. And uh, I don't have any additional comments. So Bob, you're here. <laughs> Yes, I just wanted to comment, a couple of other board members mentioned this. Uh, a few years ago, we were in, the, uh, in a situation where we had to do some fairly serious uh, cuts. And at that time, there was a lot of discussion. Uh, some of us took a lot of heat. Uh, I know I personally talked to numerous uh, uh, staff uh, regarding this issue, and that concerns uh, the board's decision uh, to increase the participation rate of the employees in their own medical insurance and other benefits. And so tonight, the fact that we get to restore some of that, I hope uh, kind of uh, allows uh, people out there that this affected the most to know that, hey, look, we had to do that at that time. There wasn't any choice. We had to do it. And now we're, we're trying to uh, put things back a, a little, not totally, but clo closer to where it ought to be. And so uh, that's what I wanted to say. All right, with that, the uh, meeting is adjourned.